Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? A Dead Finger by Sabin Baring Gould. 1. Why the National Gallery should not attract so many visitors as, say, the British Museum, I cannot explain. The latter does not contain much that one would suppose appeals to the interest of the ordinary sightseer. What knows such of prehistoric flints and scratched bones, or Assyrian sculpture, or Egyptian hieroglyphics? The Greek and Roman statuary is cold and dead. The paintings in the National Gallery glow with colour and are instinct with life, yet somehow a few listless wanderers saunter yawning through the National Gallery, whereas swarms pour through the halls of the British Museum and talk and pass remarks about the objects there exposed, of the date and meaning of which they have not the faintest conception. I was thinking of this problem and endeavouring to unravel it, one morning whilst sitting in the room for English masters at the great collection in Trafalgar Square. At the same time another thought forced itself upon me. I had been through the rooms devoted to foreign schools, and had then come into that given over to Reynolds, Morland, Gainsborough, Constable and Hogarth. The morning had been for a while propitious, but towards noon a dense umber-tinted fog had come on making it all but impossible to see the pictures, and quite impossible to do them justice. I was tired, and so seated myself on one of the chairs, and fell into the consideration, first of all, of why the National Gallery is not as popular as it should be, and secondly, how it was that the British school had no beginnings uh, like those of Italy and the Netherlands. We can see the art of the painter from its first initiation in the Italian peninsula and among the Flemings. It starts on its progress like a child, and we can trace every stage of its growth. Not so with English art. It springs to life in full and splendid maturity. Who were there before Reynolds and Gainsborough and Hogarth? the great names of those portrait and subject painters who have left their canvases upon the walls of our country houses were those of foreigners, Holbin, Kneller, Van Dyck and Lely for portraits and Monoya for flower and fruit pieces. Landscapes, figure subjects, were all importations, none homegrown. How came that about? Was there no limna that was native? Was it that fashion trampled on home-grown pictorial beginnings as it flouted and spurned native music? Here was food for contemplation, dreaming in the brown fog, looking through it without seeing its beauties at Hogarth's painting of Lavinia Fenton as Polly Peachum, without wondering how so indifferent a beauty could have captivated the Duke of Bolton and held him for thirty years. I was recalled to myself and my surroundings by the strange conduct of a lady who had seated herself on a chair near me, also discouraged by the fog and awaiting its dispersion. I had not noticed her particularly. At the present moment I do not remember particularly what she was like. So far as I can recollect, she was middle-aged and was quietly yet well-dressed, it was not her face nor her dress that attracted my attention and disturbed the current of my thoughts. The effect I speak of was produced by her strange movements and behaviour. She had been sitting listless, probably thinking of nothing at all, or nothing in particular, when, in turning her eyes round and finding that she could see nothing of the paintings, she began to study me. This did concern me greatly. A cat may look at the king, but to be contemplated by a lady is a compliment sufficient to please any gentleman. It was not gratified vanity that troubled my thoughts, but the consciousness that my appearance produced, first of all, a startled surprise, then undisguised alarm, and finally, indescribable horror. Now, a man can sit quietly, leaning on the head of his umbrella, 
and glow internally, warmed and illumined by the consciousness that he is being surveyed with admiration by a lovely woman, even when he is middle-aged and not fashionably dressed. But no man can maintain his composure when he discovers himself to be an object of aversion and terror. What was it? I passed my hand over my chin and upper lip, thinking it not impossible that I might have forgotten to have shaved that morning, and in my confusion not considering that the fog would prevent the lady from discovering neglect in this particular, had it occurred, which it had not. I am a little careless, perhaps, about shaving when in the country, but when in town, never. The next idea that occurred to me was a smut. Had a London black, curdled in that dense pea-soup atmosphere, descended on my nose and blackened it? I hastily drew my silk handkerchief from my pocket, moistened it, and passed it over my nose and then each cheek. I then turned my eyes into the corners and looked at the lady, to see whether by this means I had got rid of what was objectionable in my personal appearance. Then I saw that her eyes, dilated with horror, were riveted not on my face, but on my leg. My leg. What on earth could that harmless member have in it so terrifying? The morning had been dull, uh, there had been rain in the night, and I admit that on leaving my hotel I had turned up the bottoms of my trousers. That is a proceeding not so uncommon, not so outrageous as to account for the stony stare of this woman's eyes. If that were all, I would turn my trousers down. Then I saw her shrink from the chair on which she sat to one further removed from me, but still with her eyes fixed on my leg, about the level of my knee. She had let fall her umbrella and was grasping the seat of her chair with both hands as she backed from me. I need hardly say that I was greatly disturbed in mind and feelings, and forgot all about the origin of the English schools of painters and the question why the British Museum is more popular than the National Gallery. Thinking that I might have been spattered by a hansom whilst crossing Oxford Street, I passed my hand down my side hastily with a sense of annoyance, and all at once touched something cold, clammy, that sent a thrill to my heart and made me start and take a step forward. At the same moment the lady, with a cry of horror, sprang to her feet, and with raised hands fled from the room, leaving her umbrella where it had fallen. There were other visitors to the picture gallery besides ourselves who had been passing through the saloon, and they turned at her cry and looked in surprise after her. The policeman stationed in the room came to me and asked what had happened. I was in such agitation that I hardly knew what to answer. I told him that I could explain what had occurred little better than himself. I had noticed that the lady had worn an odd expression and had behaved in most extraordinary fashion, and that he had best take charge of her umbrella and wait for her to return to claim it. This questioning by the official was vexing, as it prevented me from at once and on the spot investigating the cause of her alarm and mine, hers at something she must have seen on my leg, and mine at something I had distinctly felt creeping up my leg. The numbing and sickening effect of me of the touch of the object I had not seen was not to be shaken off at once. Indeed, I felt as though my hand were contaminated, and that I could have no rest till I had thoroughly washed the hand and, if possible, washed away the feeling that had been produced. I looked on the floor and examined my leg, but saw nothing. As I wore my overcoat, it was probable that in rising from my seat the skirt had fallen over my trousers and hidden the thing, whatever it was. I therefore hastily removed my overcoat and shook it. Then I looked at my trousers. There was nothing whatever on my leg, and nothing fell from my overcoat when shaken. Accordingly, I reinvested myself and hastily left the gallery then took my way as speedily as I could, without actually running, to Charing Cross Station and down the narrow way leading to the Metropolitan, 
where I went into Falconer's bath and hairdressing establishment, and asked for hot water to thoroughly wash my hand and well soap it. I bathed my hand in water as hot as I could endure it, employed carbolic soap, and then, after having a good brush down, especially on my left side, where my hand had encountered the object that had so affected me, I left. I had entertained the intention of going to the Princess's theatre that evening, and of securing a ticket in the morning, but all thought of theatre-going was gone from me. I could not free my heart from the sense of nausea and cold that had been produced by the touch. I went into Gatti's to have lunch, and ordered something, I forget what, but when served I found that my appetite was gone. I could eat nothing, the food inspired me to disgust. I thrust it from me untasted, and, after drinking a couple of glasses of claret, left the restaurant and returned to my hotel. Feeling sick and faint, I threw my overcoat over the sofa back and cast myself on my bed. I do not know that there was any particular reason for my doing so, but as I lay, my eyes were on my greatcoat. The density of the fog had passed away, and there was light again, not of first quality, but sufficient for a Londoner to swear by, so that I could see everything in my room, though through a veil, darkly. I do not think my mind was occupied in any way. About the only occasions on which, to my knowledge, my mind is actually passive or inert is when crossing the channel in the foam from Dover to Calais, when I am always, in every weather, abjectly seasick and thoughtless. But as I now lay on my bed, uncomfortable, squeamish, without knowing why, I was in the same inactive mental condition. But not for long. I saw something that startled me. First, it appeared to me as if the lappet of my overcoat pocket were in movement, being raised. I did not pay much attention to this, as I supposed that the garment was sliding down onto the seat of the sofa from the back, and that this displacement of gravity caused the movement I observed. But this, I soon saw, was not the case. That which moved the lappet was something in the pocket that was struggling to get out. I could see now that it was working its way up the inside, and that when it reached the opening it lost balance and fell down again. I could make this out by the projections and indentations in the cloth. These moved as the creature, or whatever it was, worked its way up the lining. A mouse, I said, and forgot my seediness. I was interested. The little rascal! How ever did he contrive to seat himself in my pocket? And I have worn that overcoat all the morning. But no, it was not a mouse. I saw something white poke its way out from under the lappet, and in another moment an object was revealed that, though revealed, I could not understand, nor could I distinguish what it was. Now, roused by curiosity, I raised myself on my elbow. In doing this, I made some noise as the bed creaked. Instantly, the something dropped on the floor, lay outstretched for a moment to recover itself, and then began, with the motions of a maggot, to run along the floor. There is a caterpillar called the measurer, because when it advances, it draws its tail up to where its head is, and then throws forward its full length, and again draws up its extremity, forming at each time a loop, and with each step measuring its total length. The object I now saw on the floor was advancing precisely like the measuring caterpillar. It had the colour of a cheese maggot, and in length was about three and a half inches. It was not, however, like a caterpillar, which is flexible throughout its entire length. But this was, as it seemed to me, jointed in two places, one joint being more conspicuous than the other. For some moments I was so completely paralysed by astonishment that I remained motionless, 
looking at the thing as it crawled along the carpet, a dull green carpet with darker green, almost black flowers in it. It had, as it seemed to me, a glossy head, distinctly marked, but as the light was not brilliant, I could not make out very clearly, and, moreover, the rapid movements prevented close scrutiny. Presently, with a shock still more startling than that produced by its apparition at the opening of the pocket of my greatcoat, I became convinced that what I saw was a finger, a human forefinger, and that the glossy head was no other than the nail. The finger did not seem to have been amputated. There was no sign of blood or laceration where the knuckle should be. But the extremity of the finger, or, or root rather, faded away to indistinctness, and I was unable to make out the root of the finger. I could see no hand, no body behind the finger, nothing whatever except a finger that had a little token of warm life in it, no coloration as though blood circulated in it, and this finger was in active motion, creeping along the carpet towards a wardrobe that stood against the wall by the fireplace. I sprang off the bed and pursued it. Evidently the finger was alarmed, for it redoubled its pace, reached the wardrobe, and went under it. By the time I had arrived at the article of furniture, it had disappeared. I lit a Vesta match and held it beneath the wardrobe that was raised above the carpet by about two inches, on turned feet, but I could see nothing more of the finger. I got my umbrella and thrust it beneath and raked forwards and backwards, right and left, and raked out flue and nothing more solid. 2. I packed my portmanteau next day and returned to my home in the country. All desire for amusement in town was gone, and the faculty to transact business had departed as well. A languor and qualms had come over me, and my head was in a maze. I was unable to fix my thoughts on anything. At times I was disposed to believe that my wits were deserting me, at others that I was on the verge of a severe illness. Anyhow, whether likely to go off my head or not, or take to my bed, home was the only place for me, and homeward I sped accordingly. On reaching my country habitation, my servant, as usual, took my portmanteau to my bedroom, unstrapped it, but did not unpack it. I object to his throwing out the contents of my Gladstone bag. Not that there is anything in it he may not see, but that he puts my things where I cannot find them again. My clothes, he is welcome to place them where he likes and where they belong, and this latter he knows better than I do. But then I carry about with me other things than a dress suit and changes of linen and flannel. There are letters, papers, books, and the proper destinations of these are known only to myself. A servant has a singular and evil knack for putting away literary matter and odd volumes in such places that it takes the owner half a day to find them again. Although I was uncomfortable and my head in a whirl, I opened and unpacked my own portmanteau. As I was thus engaged, I saw something curled up in my collar box, the lid of which had got broken in by a boot heel impinging on it. I had pulled off the damaged cover to see if my collars had been spoiled, when something curled up inside suddenly rose on end and leapt, just like a cheese jumper, out of the box, over the edge of the Gladstone bag, and scurried away across the floor in a manner already familiar to me. I could not doubt for a moment what it was. Here was the finger again. It had come with me from London to the country. Whither it went on its run over the floor, I do not know. I was too bewildered to observe. Somewhat later, towards evening, I seated myself in my easy chair, took up a book and tried to read it. I was tired with the journey and the knocking about in town and the discomfort and alarm produced by the apparition of the finger. I felt worn out. I was unable to give my attention to what I read, and before I was aware was asleep. Roused for an instant by the fall of the book from my hands, I speedily relapsed into unconsciousness. 
I am not sure that a doze in an armchair ever does good. It usually leaves me in a semi-stupid condition and with a headache. Five minutes in a horizontal position on my bed is worth thirty in a chair. That is my experience. In sleeping in a sedentary position the head is a difficulty. It drops forward or lolls on one side or the other and has to be brought back into a position in which the line of the centre of gravity runs through the trunk, otherwise the head carries the body over in a sort of general capsize out of the chair onto the floor. I slept, on the occasion of which I am speaking, pretty healthily, because deadly weary, but I was brought to waking not by my head falling over the arm of the chair and my trunk tumbling after it, but by a feeling of cold extending from my throat to my heart. When I awoke I was in a diagonal position, with my right ear resting on my right shoulder and exposing the left side of my throat, and it was here, where the jugular vein throbs, that I felt the greatest intensity of cold. At once I shrugged my left shoulder, rubbing my neck with the collar of my coat in so doing. Immediately something fell off upon the floor, and I again saw the finger. My disgust, horror, were intensified when I perceived that it was dragging something after it, which might have been an old stocking, and which I took at first glance for something of the sort. The evening sun shone in through my window in a brilliant golden ray that lighted the object as it scrambled along. With this illumination I was able to distinguish what the object was. It is not easy to describe it, but I will make the attempt. The finger I saw was solid and material. What it drew after it was neither, or was in a nebulous protoplasmic condition. The finger was attached to a hand that was curdling into matter and in process of acquiring solidity. Attached to the hand was an arm in a very filmy condition, and this arm belonged to a human body in a still more vaporous immaterial condition. This was being dragged along the floor by the finger, just as a silkworm might pull after it the tangle of its web. I could see legs and arms and head and coat tail, tumbling about and interlacing and disentangling again in a promiscuous manner. There were no bone, no muscle, no substance in the figure. The members were attached to the trunk, which was spineless, but they had evidently no functions and were wholly dependent on the finger which pulled them along in a jumble of parts as it advanced. In such confusion did the whole vaporous matter seem that I think, I cannot say for certain it was so, but the impression left on my mind was that one of the eyeballs was looking out at a nostril and the tongue lolling out of one of the ears. It was, however, only for a moment that I saw this germ body. I cannot call by another name that which had not more substance than smoke. I saw it only so long as it was being dragged athwart the ray of sunlight. The moment it was pulled jerkily out of the beam into the shadow beyond, I could see nothing of it, only the crawling finger. I had not sufficient moral energy or physical force in me to rise, pursue and stamp on the finger and grind it with my heel into the floor. Both seemed drained out of me. What became of the finger, whither it went, how it managed to secrete itself, I do not know. I had lost the power to inquire. I sat in my chair, chilled, staring before me into space. Please, sir, a voice said, there's Mr. Square below, electrical engineer. Hey? I looked dreamily around. My valet was at the door. Please, sir, the gentleman would be glad to be allowed to go over the house and see that all the electrical apparatus is in order. Oh, indeed, yes, uh, show him up. 3. I had recently placed the lighting of my house in the hands of an electrical engineer, a very intelligent man, a Mr. Square, for whom I had contracted a sincere friendship. He had built a shed with a dynamo out of sight and had entrusted the laying of the wires to subordinates as he had been busy with other orders and could not personally watch every detail, 
but he was not the man to let anything pass unobserved, and he knew that electricity was not a force to be played with. Bad or careless workmen will often insufficiently protect the wires, or neglect the insertion of the lead which serves as a safety valve in the event of the current being too strong. Houses may be set on fire, human beings fatally shocked by the neglect of a bad or slovenly workman. The apparatus for my mansion was but just completed, and Mr. Square had come to inspect it and make sure that all was right. He was an enthusiast in the subject of electricity, and saw for it a vast perspective, the limits of which could not be predicted. All forces, said he, are correlated. When you have a force in one form, you may just turn it into this or that as you like. In one form it's motive power, in another it's light, in another heat. Now we have electricity for illumination. We employ it, but not as freely as in the States, for propelling vehicles. Why should we have horses drawing our buses? We should use only electric trams. Why do we burn coal to warm our shins? There is electricity which throws out no filthy smoke as does coal. Why should we let the tides waste their energies in the Thames, in other estuaries? There we have nature supplying us, free, gratis, and for nothing, with all the force we want for propelling, for heating, for lighting. I'll tell you something more, my dear sir, said Mr. Square. I have mentioned but three modes of force, and have instanced but a limited number of uses to which electricity may be turned. How is it with photography? Is not electric light becoming an artistic agent? I bet you, said he, before long it will become a therapeutic agent as well. Oh, yes, I've heard of certain impostors with their life belts. Mr. Square did not relish this little dig I gave him. He winced, but returned to the charge. We don't know how to direct it all right, that's all, said he. I haven't taken the matter up, but others will, I bet, and we shall have electricity used as freely as now we use powders and pills. I don't believe in doctor's stuffs myself. I hold the disease lays hold of a man because he lacks physical force to resist it. Now, is it not obvious that you are beginning at the wrong end when you attack the disease? What you want is to supply force, make up for the lack of physical power, and force is force wherever you find it, here motive, there illuminating, and so on. I don't see why a physician should not utilise the tide rushing out on the London Bridge for restoring the feeble vigour of all who are languid and prey to disorder in the metropolis. It will come to that, I bet. And that is not all. Force is force everywhere. Political, moral force, physical force, dynamic force, heat, light, tidal waves, and so on, are all one. All is one. In time, we shall know how to galvanize into aptitude and moral energy all the limp and crooked consciences and wills that need taking in hand, as such there always will be in modern civilization. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how it will be done. But in the future, the priest as well as the doctor will turn electricity on as his principal, nay, his only agent and he can get his force anywhere, out of the running stream, out of the wind, out of the tidal wave. I'll give you an instance, continued Mr. Square, chuckling and rubbing his hands, to show you the great possibilities in electricity used in a crude fashion. In a certain great city away far west in the States, a go-ahead place too, more so than New York, they had electric trams all up and down and along the roads to everywhere. The union men working for the company demanded the non-unionists should be turned off, but the company didn't see it. Instead, it turned off the union men. It had up its sleeve a sufficiency of the others and filled all places at once. Union men didn't like it and passed word that at a given hour on a certain day every wire was to be cut. The company knew this by means of its spies and turned on, ready for them, three times the power into all the wires. At the fixed moment, up the poles went the strikers to cut the cables. 
And down they came a dozen times quicker than they went up, I bet. Then there came wires to the hospitals from all quarters for stretchers to carry off the disabled men, some with broken arms, legs, ribs, two or three had their necks broken. I reckon the company was wonderfully merciful. It didn't put on sufficient force to make cinders of them there and then. Possibly opinion might not have liked it. Stop the strike did that. Great moral effect. All done by electricity. In this manner Mr. Square was wont to rattle on. He interested me, and I came to think that there might be something in what he said, that his suggestions were not mere nonsense. I was glad to see Mr. Square enter my room, shown in by my man. I did not rise from my chair to shake his hand, for I had not sufficient energy to do so. In a languid tone I welcomed him and signed to him to take a seat. Mr. Square looked at me with some surprise. "'Why, what's the matter?' he said. "'You seem unwell. Not got the flu, have you? I beg your pardon. The influenza. Every third person's crying out that he has it, and the sale of eucalyptus is enormous. Not that eucalyptus is any good. Influenza microbes, indeed. What care they for eucalyptus?' "'You've gone down some steps of the ladder of life since I saw you last, Squire. How do you account for that?' I hesitated about mentioning the extraordinary circumstances that had occurred, but Square was a man who would not allow any beating about the bush. He was downright and straight, and in ten minutes had got the entire story out of me. "'Rather boisterous for your nerves, that, a crawling finger,' said he. "'It's a queer story taken on end.' Then he was silent, considering. After a few minutes he rose and said, "'I'll go and look at the fittings, and then I'll turn this little matter of yours over again, and see if I can't knock the bottom out of it. I'm kind of fond of these sort of things.' Mr. Square was not a Yankee, but he had lived for some time in America, and affected to speak like an American. He used expressions, terms of speech common in the States, but had none of the transatlantic twang. He was a man absolutely without affectation in every other particular. This was his sole weakness, and it was harmless. The man was so thorough in all he did that I did not expect his return immediately. He was certain to examine every portion of the dynamo engine and all the connections and burners. This would necessarily engage him for some hours. As the day was nearly done, I knew he could not accomplish what he wanted that evening, and accordingly gave orders that a room should be prepared for him. Then, as my head was full of pain and my skin was burning, I told my servant to apologise for my absence from dinner, and tell Mr. Square that I was really forced to return to my bed by sickness, and that I believed I was about to be prostrated by an attack of influenza. The valet, a worthy fellow who has been with me for six years, was concerned at my appearance and urged me to allow him to send for a doctor. I had no confidence in the local practitioner, and if I sent for another from the nearest town I should offend him, and a row would perhaps ensue, so I declined. If I were really in for an influenza attack, I knew about as much as any doctor how to deal with it. Quinine, quinine, that was all. I bade my man light a small lamp, lower it so as to give sufficient illumination to enable me to find some lime juice at my bedhead and my pocket handkerchief, and to be able to read my watch. When he had done this, I bade him leave me. I lay in bed, burning, racked with pain in my head, and with my eyeballs on fire. Whether I fell asleep or went off my head, I cannot tell. I may have fainted. I have no recollection of anything after having gone to bed and taking a sip of lime juice that tasted to me like soap, till I was roused by a sense of pain in my ribs, a slow, gnawing, torturing pain, waxing momentarily more intense. In half-consciousness I was partly dreaming and partly aware of actual suffering. The pain was real, but in my fancy I thought that a great maggot was working its way into my side, between my ribs. I seemed to see it. 
It twisted itself half round, then reverted to its former position, and again twisted itself, moving like a brattle, not like a gimlet, which latter forms a complete revolution. This, obviously, must have been a dream, hallucination only, as I was lying on my back, and my eyes were directed towards the bottom of the bed, and the coverlet and blankets and sheet intervened between my eyes and my side. But in fever one sees without eyes, and in every direction and through all obstruction. Roused thoroughly by an excruciating twinge, I tried to call out, and succeeded in throwing myself over on my right side, that which was in pain. At once I felt the thing withdrawn that was crawling, if I may use the word, in between my ribs. And now I saw, standing beside the bed, a figure that had its arm under the bedclothes and was slowly removing it. The hand was leisurely drawn from under the coverings and rested on the eider-down coverlet with the forefinger extended. The figure was that of a man in shabby clothes with a sallow, mean face, a retreating forehead with hair cut after the French fashion and a moustache dark the jaws and chin were covered with a bristly growth, as if shaving had been neglected for a fortnight. The figure did not appear to be thoroughly solid, but to be of the consistency of curd, and the face was of the complexion of curd. As I looked at this object, it withdrew, sliding backward in an odd sort of manner, and as though overweighted by the hand which was the most substantial indeed the only substantial portion of it though the figure retreated stooping yet it was no longer huddled along by the finger as if it had no material existence if the same it had acquired a consistency and a solidity which it did not possess before how it vanished i do not know nor whither it went the door opened and square came in what he exclaimed with cheery voice influenza is it i don't know i think it's that finger again four now look here said square i'm not going to have that cuss at its pranks any more tell me all about it i was now so exhausted so feeble that i was not able to give a connected account of what had taken place but square put to me just a few pointed questions and elicited the main facts he pieced them together in his own orderly mind so as to form a connected whole. There's a feature in the case, said he, that strikes me as remarkable and important. At first, a finger only, then a hand, then a nebulous figure attached to the hand without backbone, without consistency. Lastly, a complete form, with consistency and with backbone, but the latter in a gelatinous condition and the entire figure overweighted by the hand, just as hand and figure were previously overweighted by the finger. Simultaneously with this compacting and consolidating of the figure came your degeneration and loss of vital force, and, in a word, of health. What you lose, that object acquires. And what it gains, it gains by contact with you. That's clear enough, is it not? I dare say, I don't know, I can't think. Suppose not. The faculty of thought is drained out from you. Very well. I must think for you, and I will. Force is force, and see if I can't deal with your visitant in such a way as will prove just as truly a moral dissuasive as that employed on the union men on strike in... Uh, never mind where it was. That's not the point. Will you kindly give me some... "'Lime juice,' I entreated. "'I sipped the acid draught, but without relief. "'I listened to Square, but without hope. "'I wanted to be left alone. "'I was weary of my pain, weary of everything, even of life. "'It was a matter of indifference to me "'whether I recovered or slipped out of existence. "'It will be here again shortly,' said the engineer. "'As the French say, l'appétit vient en mangeant.' It has been at you thrice. It won't be content without another peck, and if it does get another, I guess it will pretty well about finish you. Mr. Square rubbed his chin, and then put his hands into his trouser pockets, 
That also was a trick acquired in the States, an inelegant one. His hands, when not actively occupied, went into his pockets. Inevitably, they gravitated thither. Ladies did not like Square. Uh, they said he was not a gentleman. But it was not that he said or did anything off colour. Only he spoke to them, looked at them, walked with them, always with his hands in his pockets. I have seen a lady turn her back on him deliberately because of this trick. Standing now with his hands in his pockets, he studied my bed and said contemptuously, "'Old-fashioned and bad for poster. Oughtn't to be allowed, I guess. Unwholesome, all the way round.' I was not in a condition to dispute this. I like a four-poster, with curtains at head and feet, not that I ever draw them, but it gives a sense of privacy that is wanting in one of your half-tester beds. If there is a window at one's feet, one can lie in bed without the glare in one's eyes, and yet without darkening the room by drawing the blinds. There is much to be said for a four-poster, but this is not the place in which to say it. Mr. Square pulled his hands out of his pockets and began fiddling with the electric point near the head of my bed, attached a wire, swept it in a semicircle along the floor, and then thrust the knob at the end into my hand in the bed. "'Keep your eye open,' said he and your hand shut and covered. If that finger comes again tickling your ribs, try it with the point. I'll manage the switch from behind the curtain. Then he disappeared. I was too indifferent in my misery to turn my head and observe where he was. I remained inert with the knob in my hand and my eyes closed, suffering, and thinking of nothing but the shooting pains through my head and the aches in my loins and back and legs. Some time probably elapsed before I felt the finger again at work at my ribs. It groped, but no longer bored. I now felt the entire hand, not a single finger, and the hand was substantial, cold and clammy. I was aware, how I know not, that if the finger point reached the region of my heart on the left side, the hand would, so to speak, sit down on it, with the cold palm over it, and that then immediately my heart would cease to beat, and it would be, as Square might express it, gone coon with me. In self-preservation, I brought up the knob of the electric wire against the hand, against one of the ringers, I think, and at once was aware of a rapping, squealing noise. I turned my head languidly and saw the form, now more substantial than before, capering in an ecstasy of pain, endeavouring fruitlessly to withdraw its arm from under the bedclothes and the hand from the electric point. At the same moment Square stepped out from behind the curtain with a dry laugh and said, I thought we should fix him. He has the coil about him and can't escape. Now let us drop to particulars, but I shan't let off till I know all about you. The last sentence was addressed not to me but to the apparition. Thereupon he bade me take the point away from the hand of the figure, uh, being, uh, whatever it was, but to be ready with it at a moment's notice. He then proceeded to catechise my visitor, who moved restlessly within the circle of wire, but could not escape from it. It replied in a thin, squealing voice that sounded as if it came from a distance and had a querulous tone in it, I do not pretend to give all that was said. I cannot recollect everything that passed. My memory was affected by my illness as well as my body, yet I prefer giving the scraps that I recollect to what Mr. Square told me he had heard. Yes, I was unsuccessful, always was. Nothing answered with me. The world was against me. Society was. I hate society. I don't like work, neither. Never did. But I like agitating against what is established. I hate the royal family, the landed interests, the parsons, everything, that is, except the people, that is, the unemployed. I always did. I couldn't get work as suited me. When I died, they buried me in a cheap coffin, dirt cheap, and gave me a nasty grave, cheap, and the service rattled away cheap, and no monument. Didn't want none. Oh, there are lots of us. All discontented, discontent, 
that's the passion it is. It gets into the veins, it fills the brain, it occupies the heart. It's a sort of divine cancer that takes possession of the entire man and makes him dissatisfied with everything and hates everybody. But we must have our share of happiness at some time. We all crave for it in one way or other. Some think there's a future state of blessedness and so have hope and look to attain it, for hope is a cable and an anchor that attaches to what is real. But when you have no hope of that sort, don't believe in any future state. You must look for happiness in life here. We didn't get it when we were alive, so we seek to procure it after we are dead. We can do it, if we can get out of our cheap and nasty coffins, but not until the greater part of us is moulded away. If a finger or two remains, that can work its way up to the surface. Those cheap deal coffins go to pieces quick enough. Then the only solid part of us left can pull the rest of us that has gone to nothing after it. Then we grope about after the living, the well-to-do if we can get at them, the honest working poor if we can't. We hate them too because they are content and happy. If we reach any of these and can touch them, then we can draw their vital force out of them into ourselves and recuperate at their expense. That was about what I was going to do with you. Getting on famous, nearly solidified into a new man and given another chance of life. But I've missed it this time. Just like my luck. Miss everything. Always have. Except misery and disappointment. Get plenty of that. What are you all? asked Square. Anarchists out of employ? Some of us go by that name, some by other designations. But we're all one, and own allegiance to but one monarch. Sovereign discontent. We are bred to have a distaste for manual work, and we grow up loafers, grumbling at everything and quarrelling with society that is around us and the providence that is above us. And what do you call yourselves now? call ourselves nothing. We are the same in another condition, that is all. Folk called us once anarchists, nihilists, socialists, levelers. Now they call us the influenza. The learned talk of microbes and bacilli and bacteria. Microbes, bacilli and bacteria be blowed. We are the influenza. We the social failures, the generally discontented coming up out of our cheap and nasty graves in the form of physical disease. We are the influenza. There you are, I guess, exclaimed Square triumphantly. Did I not say that all forces were correlated? If so, then all negotiations, deficiencies of force, are one in their several manifestations. Talk of divine discontent as a force impelling to progress. Rubbish! It is a paralysis of energy. It turns all it absorbs to acid, to envy, spite, gall. It inspires nothing, but rots the whole moral system. Here you have it, moral, social, political discontent in another form. Nay, aspect, that is all. What anarchism is in the body politic, that influenza is in the body physical. Do you see that? Yes. I believe I answered, and dropped away into the land of dreams. I recovered. What Square did with the thing, I know not, but believe that he reduced it again to its former negative and self-decomposing condition. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? Didn't you? What's the secret? That was A Dead Finger by Sabin Bearing Gould. Very easy to call him Sabine Bearing Gould, um, but I made sure I checked the pronunciation. I do that more and more these days. 
uh, because what I've realized is that there are many people out there who know a lot more than me about many things and uh, and if I get them wrong I haven't got a lot of room for maneuver so I do a bit of checking um this is the part of this in case you hadn't realized this is the part of the episode whereby wherewith wherefore unto I start to talk about the story and the author and this is the author I just say little bits I've learned about him I make comments about the story which arise to me so think of it as having a conversation with your uh, the single uncle you had who always used to come round and after a couple of drinks would drone on about something that he didn't really know anything about but you kind of were really fond of him and so you put up with him and that's what I would like to I would love you to have that uh, attitude towards me now by this time you will all realized if you haven't before whether you want to listen to this or not I'm talking too fast if you do not want to listen to it please stop do not put either us through this so you need to <laughs> write a comment at the end and go nonsense waffle yeah fine just stop listen to it um okay for those who love the nonsense waffle and there are 95 percent of people who replied to a poll to say that they did uh, that's I'm talking to you now. So let's talk about this story. This story, A Dead Finger, was first published in the Cornhill magazine, a popular literary periodical of the time, in January 1902, and it was later included in Bering Gould's collection, A Book of Ghosts, published in 1904. So what did I think about this story? Well, I thought it was like a fever dream. It was a very odd story or and i don't think this is likely he had taken a ton a heroic dose of illicit substances but um i don't think that's true and I, i'm not sure he did write it in the fever dream although somebody may know more about him and say oh yeah it came from the take got the idea when he had scarlet fever one time um let's think about the time frame We've done other weird stories before. The last one we did was Guy de Montpessant, who was French. And he, his stories are weird in a similar kind of pre-surrealist way. And why I say pre-surrealist, of course, the surrealists didn't, weren't a thing till the 1920s. And I think the Surrealist Manifesto came out in 1924. So this is like 20 years before that. However, it does have that um, odd juxtaposition, almost as this dream material was coming to him and it's you know how dreams are odd and bizarre and they don't fit with the real world and the surrealists made a, um, a great play of this but of course the other reason to say why i don't think he, um, bering gould was a surrealist which i'm not i'm not in any circumstances suggesting that but even related to them or influenced by ideas that were floating around at the time is that he was deeply deeply conservative uh, and this this shows in all aspects of his really interesting life, but um, anything new, he's not going to like it. Um, so I don't think he's a surrealist, but I just think it's kind of weird. Talking about that, he was um, a very accomplished and interesting man and was a clergyman. That was his main job. Uh, like Mo I don't know if you've come across Montague Summers, who wrote mainly um, so-called so factual books about vampires. He was a priest as well. Uh, an Anglican priest, you know, um, and uh, similar period. And both of those men are deeply conservative, really very reactionary figures. What struck me as really interesting is, and you've heard the story, so there's no spoilers, that the, the cause of the ghost, the ghost is the, um, the spirit, the representation of the undeserving poor. Uh, and so he, Bering Gould in this, is a is a an anti Charles Dickens in many ways, because you know in in Dickens's ghost stories the ghosts serve to advance what you might call a progressive, um, that is to say, that uh, the poor are suffering from the uh, predations of the wealthy, uh, whereas this is the other way around. Um, it's clearly the poor it's their own fault and it strikes me and you know I'm not making so obviously I'm not espousing any particular point any particular uh, political standpoint but it has I've observed in life that people who are um, generally on the left uh, tend and this isn't always true 
but they tend to come from poorer backgrounds. They're, they're the have-nots, if you like, or the have-less, because our Western societies are so much more wealthy than our ancestors and also in other communities around the world. So um, the have-nots tend to be left. That is to say, I haven't got it, I want it. You've got it, I want it. You know, that's a left. And so their view would be, Everything, the things that have gone wrong in my life are to do with the system. The system is rigged against me. And that may be true because um, to an extent, all, most of these things have some truth in them. Uh, because if you are, let's say, born in a, a sink council estate, and what I mean by that is the, the really deprived public housing, and it's all relative, with lots of crime, lots of um, mold on the ceilings, you've not got any money, you can't have the heating on, you don't have anything to eat, and the only things you can afford are low nutrition crap. So your health's poor, you take um, comfort the only way you know in, in smoking, drink and drugs, so your health is poor. So this is, this is, a, this is a familiar picture. So you may look, and, and you're start, and so, and then compare somebody like uh, M.R. James, who, who came from a wealthy background, went to the most prestigious public school in England, went to the most potentially, let's say, prestigious university. The Ox Oxford people will be up in arms about that. But, um, you know, it, it's not, they, they didn't start in the same place. So it may there may be some justice to a view that says, um, uh, you know, this system's rigged against me. Everything, this is what the ghost says, everything's against me. Let's flip it on the other side then. So the people on the other side who tend to be um, the haves, as is human nature, they don't want to give it away. You ask me, right, you've worked since you were 15 years old. Are you, are you not on the street? You've got a house. You can afford to do this podcasting thing. Why don't you give all your money away? No, thanks. If I give it away, I'll give it to my friends and my family. I don't necessarily want to give it to, um, you know, I may feel that I should, and I, you know, do, do give it to charity, but this isn't about me being virtuous. It's about looking at the, the, the right wing view, which tends to be everything I've got, I've got through my hard work. Yeah. It's mine. Why should I give it to you? If I, if I want to give it to you, then I will. Uh, and you know, charitable causes, etc. And there's a police. I always wonder, given the amount of sirens that go past in this small city, if there really are that many emergencies. Um, you know, they go by every seven minutes. Are there are there that many li life or death situations where the police and the other people need to put their sirens on? And having worked in the health service, I know I've been in the back of ambulances for people who were texting on their phones. There was nothing wrong with them. I'm talking about mental health people here. Um, but even people, you know, you've got this and we call an ambulance and you've got... Anyway, I digress, as usual. And I'm probably riling people now. So what I'm wanting to say is it's always amused me that, that people, you know, if you're on the left, it's like, I want that. I haven't got it. It's the system. And the people on the right is, it's mine. I'm not giving it to you. I've done it through my own hard work. And that isn't true either. You know, if you were born into a privileged position, it isn't all your hard work. Uh, and also, say you start a company and it does well. Uh, you know, the fact that your workers were paid for, the roads were paid for, not by you. You know, their education wasn't, you, you didn't do it. Their health, you didn't do it, you know. So um, I think I'm saying a plague on both your houses. I think I'm adopting a centrist position is to say that probably the extremes of both sides are bad. And that was what my nana used to tell me. Moderation in all things, she said. She was a Methodist, of course, uh, but there's something in it. But, I th but um, and this is a bit of a digression because Bering Gould, somebody, I was Googling this and he's the only, and somebody called him a lefty hater, and um, said the only person who hates lefties more than Bering Gould is Dennis Wheatley. I thought that was amusing. Again, let us then, as we would with Philip Larkin or um, Seneca or any of these dudes, or Mark Twain, uh, Henry James, whatever, whatever, we're going we're gonna to remove their... It, it, as much as we can, we're going to look at the story for, for the story um, without kind of cancelling them before we get there. I don't like your politics. I'm not going to read your, your stuff. Um, let's, let's look at the story. So the story was, returning to the very point, weird um and i think 
it was very witty. Uh, I think that his portrait of Mr. Square, the American influenced, although without the transatlantic twang, uh, Mr. Squ thank goodness for me, my accents, uh, Mr. Square, he was, it was really, really funny. And also the picture of the, um, the protagonist who becomes increasingly vapid and neurotic, uh, almost, and I'm like, I think that Bering Gould is, is character, caricaturing both of these the the practical men of the world knows things about electricity and the please give me some juice sort of pathetic uh, takes to his bed at the slightest um, I just read an Agatha Christie story of course with a uh, with again a complicated uh, character um, which was the case of the perfect maid fantastic nip over the, to, to the detective channel my detective uh, classic detective stories channel and that's a great story it's coming out it's not, it hasn't actually out yet but it'll be out so but I've got plenty of other stories like that. Anyway, so she in that story is again a neurotic uh, a hypochondriac, really. Uh, and so I thought that Bering Gould's pictures of both these characters was really funny. There were some other really interesting ideas in it. The first is Mr. Square with his uh, espousal of the powers of electricity. Another thought occurs to me, which I will park and maybe come back to, um, is... He is very uh, perspicacious, isn't he? He's very far-seeing. This idea of uh, power, electrical power from uh, the waves, the tides, the sun, the moon, and not the moon, he doesn't say that, that just popped out of my head from somewhere. Um, you know, he's right, isn't he? How did it, this is 1904, 1902. Um, it was published in the collection in 1904. How, wow, amazing. And, of course, it also made me think of the theory of everything. You know, physicists have been battling to try and tie all the known forces, gravity and electrical force and all the others, um, into one unified, and they go up the string theory. Again, there are people out there who know a lot more about this than me. But, um, and they've failed so far. Um, it may always fail. It may, be, uh, it may be that it isn't true. But, you know, they're doing their best. Fair play to them. And, uh, but it's, it's, it seems that Mr. Square has already got one. Everything is electricity. And, but, it, but further than just the, the gravitational and the electrical fields, he is actually, he's talking about moral energy. And he thinks that is, and so he sees how doctors and priests will um, be able to correct problems in their patients or their parishioners through applying electricity. And this is the, his whole theory that how he's going to sort the ghost out. So how far um, Bering Gould actually believed this is really interesting. And when we look at the idea of vitalism, which was a theory that uh, came in the uh, middle to the, well, the late 18th century, uh, and I've looked this up. So uh, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach and Hans Driesch, um, they have this idea that there is one force which is the life force, that the thing that makes us live and goes through the animals and the plants as well is the life force, and it is a force like electricity, and the two get conflated. And so we have this idea that um, life is created by electricity. And of course, we see this in 1819 in Frankenstein. The monster is animated through electricity. So this was a, this was a prevalent idea or a popular idea in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And it's developed or um, taken on by um, Franz Anton Mesmer. Mesmerism, you'll have heard of him, born 1734, died 1815. And he was a German physician with an interest in astronomy. Astronomy, astronomy. That's something to do with lack of holes, I think, in Greek. Um, so he theorized the process of natural energy, this vitalism, and he called it animal magnetism. And it was about not so much that, um, not just that we're animated by this force, but that it's transferred and that it could be manipulated through mesmerism, of course, develops into um, hypnotism. And the original idea, I don't think any proponents of hypnotism say that, it was something to do with the hypnotist, the mesmer, mesmerist, manipulating the electrical, this electrical um, force. 
So he would, he, Mesmer would sit in front of patients with his knees touching the patient's knees, pressing the patient's thumbs in his hands, looking fixedly into the patient's eyes. He made passes, i.e. moving his hands from the patient's shoulders down along their arms. He then pressed the fingers on the patient's hypochondrium, the area below the diaphragm hypochondriac, eh? sometimes holding his hands there for hours. Many patients felt peculiar sensations or had convulsions that were regarded as crises and were supposed to bring about the cure. So this is really interesting because it's very similar to that faith healing idea where they push them and then they're cured, you know. So, um, and it is not dissimilar to EMDR. EMDR, the eye uh, programming, which clearly has effects and there are various theories about reprogramming the hypothalamus or something. But as far as I can tell, that's all balderdash. Uh, and it's just another form. Again, there's some therapists out there going to be saying, how dare you? It's another form to me, or at least we should entertain the idea that it's another form of mesmerism. We've digressed a little bit, an interesting digression, I think. The point I wanted to make was, of course, that Mesmerism and this idea of vitalism was was pretty repudiated by the beginning of the uh, 20th century when uh, Bering Gould wrote this story. So, in but he seems to kind of still be advocating for it in a way, or, or Mr. Square is. And we have to always be careful that um, we don't make the mistake to think that a character's views are the author's views. This happens such a lot, but it isn't true. You know, a, a creative writer puts words that he or she doesn't believe in the, in the mouths of their characters. So, But it's interesting that clearly this is given as by Mr. Square and not, not challenged at all in the story uh, by Bering Gould. So I kind of think he maybe did think it. And if he did think it, in this, as in every other aspect of his life, he was old-fashioned and conservative. The other thing I wanted to say was that um, he talks about... The, the thing materializes like curd uh, and slowly. And this, of course, if you look at um, spiritualism and the mediums in the late 19th and early 20th century, ectoplasm was the big thing. So ectoplasm is this curd-like material that exudes from the medium and that the spirits use to materialize themselves. And this was found to be massively fraudulent. You may not be surprised to hear that. Uh, but it was the idea that this stuff, if you look at pictures of ectoplasm, it's this kind of curd-like stuff that gradually changes and becomes more and more solid until the ghost materialises in it. So, I mean, I think this is what we're seeing here, that whether he intended that on purpose and was a believer in it, mm, I don't know. I don't know about that, honestly. But Or it, he's just absorbed it from his cultural milieu of the time he was writing. There we go. So let me say something about the man himself. So he was a, a born into an upper class family in Exeter, Devon, as the eldest son of Edward Baring Gould, uh, a justice of the peace and deputy lieutenant of Devon, and Sophia Charlotte Bond, daughter of Admiral Francis Godolphin Bond. His privileged background offered him an, a robust education, initially through private tutors during the, during the family's extensive travels across Europe. He later attended King's College School in London and King's School in Warwick. In 1852, he went to Clare College, Cambridge, where he got his BA in 1857 and his Masters in 1860. He was a true polymath, though, whose notable achievements spanned various fields. As an author, he wrote over a 1,200 publications, including novels such as Mehala, a story of the salt marshes, the broom squire, and the folklore study. I talked about Montague Summers before. Montague Summers famously wrote about vampires. Sabine Gould's classic book in this case was The Book of Werewolves, 1865. He's really famous for his hymn writing. So hymns really famous hymns like Onward Christian Soldiers and Now the Day is Over, he wrote. In separation from that, he also wrote um, songs and ballads of the West and he collected folk music and he was deeply um, attached to the folk traditions. Um, he co-authored English folk songs for schools in 1907 with the famous Cecil, Cecil Sharp. He was also... A, um, a dedicated archaeologist and preservationist 
organizing the first scientific archaeological excavations of Dartmoor at Grimm's Pound with Robert Bernard and contributing to the systematic recording and restoration of prehistoric sites. So you can see the breadth of the man, and this is not, and although he dabbled in all these fields, he made significant contributions to them. He wasn't a playing at it. When he did his archaeology, he did it properly. When he wrote his hymns, he wrote good ones. When he did his folklore studies, they were properly done and highly regarded. So what a, a great guy. But he was, and it's really interesting, he managed to be a vicar, a clergyman at the same time, suggesting perhaps they didn't have enough work to do. Uh, I think uh, the vicars these days have 20 parishes to cover in the Anglican Church, so they don't maybe get the, the time that these gentlemen, clergymen of the Victorian period had to pursue their other uh, uh, aspects. You may not be surprised that he he was an Anglican. He was a backward-looking Anglican, because he's, again, this theme in all of these things, collecting folk songs, archaeology, his deep commitment to um, the Christianity that had been a feature of life for 2,000 years. Um, his books, it's interesting, his books are werewolves, but I think that's like his interest in folk traditions, to be honest. Uh, so there's nothing progressive about the guy, and, and that isn't a criticism, it's an observation. Um, and he was a backward-looking Anglican. So in his early days, he very much looked at the Anglican church as being a continuation of Celtic Christianity. So what you may know is that um, um, Britain became first Christian during the Roman occupation, and then the Romans left in 412 leaving a system of bishoprics based so the whole issue of um, parishes and provinces and bishops and archbishops is based on roman civil administration basically when christianity came it got grafted on to the roman civil administration so this was how they managed their provinces and each province had a an archbishop and then they the sub provinces had bishops and then the little local areas parishes had vicars you know or priests and Christianity went and it, across the urban Roman Empire this structure remained but it collapsed in Britain due to the incoming of the Anglo-Saxons those um, vandals and they're not vandals although they're closely related to the vandals uh, and they smashed everything up and uh, destroyed the culture that was here <clears throat> they were colonizers let's let's get that clear I say that with a tongue in my cheek <clears throat> it's nevertheless true in very strict sense but I'm playing with the modern usage of the word. The, so the Anglo-Saxons come in and they destroy everything. But in the, in the mountainous, wild, western north of Britain and Ireland, which was Christianized from Britain, we have what became the Celtic Christianity, which was more nature-based, was built more around because they didn't have towns as such, was built around monks who would go out and sit in caves and very much like Indian sadhus and stuff like that and then uh, collections of monks that became um, abbeys and uh, and so that it, it was a monastic Christianity it may be more spiritual I don't know I'm not getting into that really but uh, but and then what happened was the uh, the Romans came back or not the Romans but the Roman church came back through the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in Kent and going for and re-established a system of um, bishops and archbishops and things potentially still on some historical basis but uh, i'm not an expert in that at all this is just to give you the idea that's celtic christianity and then we get to Hen good old henry the eighth in the 1500s and he breaks with rome and he isn't actually a protestant he's a catholic but he has his own he's a psychopath and he has his own reasons for um his own advancement of breaking with Rome, but in religious terms, he remained a Catholic. However, there were Protestant reformers at that time, and they kind of grabbed hold of this break with Rome to Protestantize the English church. So the English church became a Protestant church. Well, in fact, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with Anglican or Episcopal, you will see they're very, very similar still in form to Catholic services, not quite the same. But there's a lot, and there was all, the high church, which was more Catholic, and the low church, which was more evangelical. So the evangelicals 
and the, the uh, austere Protestants didn't want any of the fancy stuff, smashed all the stained glass windows, do not want um, statues. The most you might get is a plain wooden cross on a plain table, or not even that, you know. So, uh, and that is the evangelical side. Well, he did not like the... he. His, his view was the Anglican Church, because what's very important in Christianity is uh, apostolic succession. So the idea that Christ gives the keys to Peter and in unbroken succession, each bishop is anointed by a bishop without going right directly back to Christ. So without a break, that's the theory. And so once the Anglican Church had broken from the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, you could argue that this was broken. So Bering Gould is about, and he's not alone. There is an Anglican movement for this. Is to say, no, yes, okay, we broke with Rome, but they were corrupt, and we were re-establishing our lineage to the pure Celtic Church, which can trace its lineage right back through Christ to Christ. Yeah. So that's what he's doing there. And later on, he became um, part of the Tractarian movement, also known as the Oxford movement. And so this was, and Bering Gould's religious views were shaped by a desire to revive and maintain the Catholic elements within Anglicanism. Um, and Tractarianism, which was an heir of the Oxford movement, emerged in the early 19th century through figures like John Henry, John Henry Newman and John Keeble emphasizing the importance of traditional liturgy, apostolic succession, and the sacraments. The movement, movement started to, excuse me, the movement sought to restore the rich ritualistic practices of the early church, challenging the more Protestant focus that had prevailed since the Reformation. So he was, so Bering Gould's there, no surprise. He was critical of uh, evangelicalism, viewing it as a departure from the rich traditions and theological depth of Anglo-Catholicism. In his work, The Evangelical Revival, 1920, he wrote condescendingly about key evangelical figures like John Wesley and George Whitefield and the movement they inspired. Bering Gould believed that evangelicalism, with its emphasis on personal conversion and simplistic piety, lacked the historical continuity and sacramental focus that he valued in the Church of England. He saw evangelicalism as overly emotional. I think that's that kind of, you know, the faith healing and the almost, well, some people may consider them hysterical practices, the speaking in tongues and things like that. Um, doctrin and doctrinally shallow. So, but he would say that, wouldn't he? He is, he is as we've said, a absolute exemplar of conservatism in every sense. So... We talked about the story, which was weird and interesting and funny and unusual because instead of the Dickensian view of the ghosts as being basically freedom fighters for the poor, you know, they're not. But you know what I mean? Certainly in Dickens they are. Um, he's the other side. And I thought it's, it's always worth seeing the other side, you know. And I, I think he was a polymath. He really was a very talented man. And um, his views, his his deep conservative views, he, he, they weren't just, they weren't unthought through. Uh, and so I thought it was worth including. I, uh, I don't, when I discuss these things, please understand, I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm not actually being polemical. I'm not saying, yes, this is the truth, and anybody else who thinks is wrong. I don't even know if this is the truth. I'm just interested in the ideas, and I know many, many of you are. Um, so if you do feel like penning a critical commentary about what you suppose my views are, don't. And with that, um, I'll go back and walk the dogs. Actually, I'm not going to walk the dogs because Sheila's come back from Spain. So she's been away in Spain doing some kind of new age thing on a mountain of selenite, so she says. Um, but she saw some wide, wide, she got a boar tooth, came across wild boars and snakes and uh, sounds like she had a great old time. I was walking the dogs, mainly walking the dogs and recording podcasts. Uh, and she's doing it now, so I don't know what to do with my time. Guess what? I'll record a podcast. You think I'd come up with something more creative, wouldn't you? What, what else are you going to do, Tony? Uh, I'll record a podcast. Anyway, I hope you're all well. I'm actually fine. But I do just want to thank you for your support because it keeps me going and it means a lot to me. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Everybody dies, don't they?